podcast is part of the 80s Ruled Network. Visit the 80s Ruled on Facebook for more 1980s awesomeness. I saw this, uh, you know, my, so during vacation, my daughter performed with her dance school at uh, Disney World. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, 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 tr- the kids were great. All the dancers, great. The parents, a bunch of assholes. A oh, lot of no. them. Dance dads <laughs> and moms. And look, we've been a lot dance of parents and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But yeah. these people are like frustrated performers. Like, you know, I, I was in theater for a number of years and I wasn't a dancer, cat's dancer. So you could attest to this, whether it applies to dance or not. Okay. In theater, if I came on stage and just before I'm about to speak or do something, I was like, you get him, Will. Hey, that's my son. Which is literally things they said to their dance girls. Wow. I would be thrown off. <laughs> yeah, no one ever did that to me. But if they did, can you imagine mm-hmm. what it would happen to me? <laughs> I'd run off stage. I was a band nerd. And yeah, yeah I, my parents never screamed. Go do it, John. Play yeah. that horn. That never happened. It was terrible. Well, if it did, I couldn't tell because it was at a football stadium. So I wouldn't know. Right. It was a little, yeah, muted, maybe. Lost in the din of the crowd. Hey, welcome back to another episode of 1980s <laughs> Now, a weekly examination of 1980s pop culture and its continued influence right now, today. My name's Will, and joining me, as always, are my friends and co-hosts, Kat and John. Hey, guys. Hi, guys. Hello there. Of course, in addition to a co-hosting our show, John hosts his own podcast, Empire Gen X. Grown up, be sure and check them out, because they're awesome. awesome. Thank you. On today's show here, we'll be discussing six 1980s toys with horrifying backstories. Mm, I was glad I didn't know <laughs> these as a kid, because uh, probably would have stayed away from all these toys. <laughs> Plus, I've got for you guys what some believed were the occult origins of even more 1980s toys. Ooh. (gasps) Uh, As a surprise. Yeah. We didn't even know that was coming. Yeah. Will is full of surprises. Uh, I love that about him. uh, And before we get to any of that, we're going to catch up on news stories. Of course, 1980s stories related to current media, including Max is back. Uh, The Beastie Boys finally make their mark. Kirk shats on Star Trek in <laughs> what the prop master of Stranger Things had to get to the hopper. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, Boo. <laughs> Boo. Get him, Courtney. <laughs> yeah, a lot of dance bombs are. There's, podcast, there's a podcast oh. dad in the audience booing. It's a this booing this dad. podcast is getting thrown out of Disney, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> hey, uh, quick announcement. <laughs> Hey, join us this Thursday, August 11th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Facebook. We're going to be streaming a podcast episode live. So the episode that'll air the following Monday, so let's say 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th? Yeah, 15th. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be recording that this Thursday, August 11th. And it's the topic that we want to hear from you. So not only will you be able to participate and give us your feedback on 1980s news of that episode, mm-hmm. we want to chat about terrible 1980s films that had great music. Yes, we do. And I, I've got some, mm. oh, John, John doesn't, does any leap to mind for you, John, offhand? Not yet. That's no. what I'm postulating. I'm like, mm, okay. the ones that oh. I hate that had great music. And if you have I'm any- I'm excited to, I got to look it up. If you have any ideas you want to include, hit us up on Facebook and uh, let us know. And we'll be sure to uh, include them in our chat on Thursday. You got one, Kat? Right. I have one, Yeah, but I don't think it's a terrible movie. Oh, okay. But apparently other people do. I know what it is. What? <laughs> does it include dancing? <laughs> yes. Does it include roller skating? Yes. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the tease right there. Everybody knows what that one is, right? Tune in <laughs> to find out. All right. Hey, tune in. Let's tune in right now to 1980s news. We've waited long enough. <laughs> and now, as reported by Deadline, a 1980s pop culture mainstay is plotting a comeback. Hey, AMC Networks is developing a Max Headroom drama series reboot. Mm-hmm. with original Max Headroom actor Matt Frewer set to reprise his role as the first artificial intelligence slash TV personality. Wow. Now, it may surprise some that I, I described this as a drama series reboot, but that's because the original Max Headroom TV series oh. was a drama. I mean, it was hard to watch. I did not know that. I, I tried. Yeah. I even have that in my media server, and it's hard to oh. watch. Yeah. <laughs> It's not the fun-loving thing that Max Headroom was. It was so yeah. weird. 
<laughs> it's kind of a, it is definitely a left turn, right? I mean, he for folks who mm-hmm. don't know, he was first introduced in the 1985 British cyberpunk TV movie Max Headroom 20 Minutes into the Future. He then went on to become a, a, you know, an instant pop culture phenom by uh, hosting videos uh, on MTV, starred in ads for New Coke, mm-hmm. he was on magazine covers, and finally, they parlayed this into an ABC uh, show for two seasons that was a drama, which saw Matt Frewer playing not only Max Headroom, mm-hmm. but also playing a human, Edison Carter, who was the programmer of the software. I only saw him on MTV or in, right. you know, yeah, other random. Go ahead, John. Uh, the genius of Max Headroom is that it looks like it's digitally generated and it's really mm-hmm. Matt Frewer in a rubber suit and a rubber yes. wig. And they just mm-hmm. edited it in such a way that it looked all glitchy and they just yeah. put a blue screen with the you know ribbons of color behind him. Right. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and now they will have to use CGI because A, it's cheaper and B, Matt Frewer is 8,900 hmm. years old. They're going to have to fix him <laughs> to make him look like Max Headroom again. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Yeah. <laughs> what does he look like? <laughs> I think he had, I think he reprised Max Headroom for something within the last few Five years, maybe a Super Bowl ad or something. Really, I, oh. I missed yeah. that. Ooh. But to your point, if they put him in a rubber suit, maybe they could just cover all the crow's feet and whatever. <laughs> just, just spackle. <laughs> <laughs> His head's really thick now. <laughs> He's got so much to cover. His eyes are so need, deep in that uh, rubber suit. I need extra headroom. Yeah, the two X headroom. <laughs> well, that's how he got his name. You know the deal, right? He, he got his name because. Because he, uh, I don't know what happened, mm. but basically the sign said maximum headroom and mm. like he had an accident where he hit that sign and that was oh. the name that the, yeah, anyway. Oh, this so, is what Edison yeah. Carter, the movie. this is an in, in, in uh, world origin you're talking in about? In world thing, right. Okay. It's like, it was like in a parking garage and he was in an accident and he hit mm-hmm. like the, the lift out that you, you know, the gate, it said maximum mm-hmm. headroom on it and he hit it and that was the name that the creation came up with. <laughs> Trivia nobody wanted. Hooray. Oh, here we go. Here. Uh, this says, uh, uh, as his popularity started to wane, he still remained a cult favorite with uh, contemporary pop culture references, including uh, on shows like BoJack Horseman, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and in Selena Gomez's music video for Love You Like a Love Song. So, okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Really? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. Right. Oh, Agents of uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. That was the best season, actually, that last season. Yeah. Wait, you Things remember Max friends. Headroom being on there? No, but one oh. of the characters was pretending to be him. So, what? It, it, no. <laughs> did you now I'm interested this? in Agents of Shield again. Oh no, oh. I didn't stick with it long enough to see yeah, the last season. Oh. Really? Well, there's know. some parts you do sort of have to stick with, but the mm-hmm. last season, yeah. what, what is it, seven or eight, is the mm-hmm. best one. And you guys need to watch it. It's it's it, a whole decade yeah. presentation. Say, it, yeah, it involves really like good. time travel and stuff, right? Like time yes, jump. Yes, there's definitely time. So you like that time travel. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't want to give you a spoiler takes. though. Huh, yeah, that's right. That's all it takes. Right. I don't want to mm. give you a spoiler on the Max Headroom reference though. It's awesome. Mm, okay. Jeez. It, it brought me great joy. <laughs> I haven't watched this like season two, so I got a lot of catching up to do. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, we just jumped to the last season. Yeah, it's fine. Right. <laughs> hey, another 1980s news. According to Rolling Stone, Beastie Boys Square is finally approved for Paul's Boutique New York City intersection. So look, if you're a fan of the Beastie are Boys. Are you so excited, Will? <laughs> am I so excited? Or you're are so you excited? so excited about that? Oh, am I so excited? No, are you? Are you? Uh, Kat, yeah. I, I've got some defect, you know. Uh, oh. It's probably the result of my 1980s rearing, which by the way, we talked about that mm-hmm. last week. And then after mm-hmm. editing the episode or listening back, I was like, I don't know that I was, I was had the freedom that Kat and John did because I think my mother had done <laughs> such a number on me as a young kid that even having the quote unquote freedom, I had a governor on me, you know? I had like a Jimmy yes. Cricket that was my mother that was always, and I lived by a mantra, which was, which, you know, kept me safe into adulthood. Don't wind up on the news. And as a kid, you know, and this is probably like what John was saying with the news, you know, 24 hour news cycle was my friends mm-hmm. would be like, Hey, let's jump off this roof and see if we can land on a car safely. And I think I could see this being on the news. You know, like two idiot <laughs> children perished today. And Hey guys, I'm out. <laughs> Why are we talking about this? I don't know. Oh, oh, because as a result, I think I have a governor on my excitement level. So yeah, I'm excited. Can't oh. you tell? Uh, oh, he's he's like he's <laughs> taking Beastie Boys brand Ritalin. Yeah. He just doesn't. He has no highs and no lows. He's if just Will can't get excited about something with the Beastie. I'm excited. Oh, it just man. Yeah, look, hey, I, I can imitate excitement. I've seen it. <laughs> And so in 2014, the city council uh, voted against Beastie Boys Square by a staggering vote of 24 to 1. But just a week or so ago, 
What? <laughs> 24 to 1. I know, right? Jeez. There was one guy come, come on, guys, come on. Nope. <laughs> no. Number sounding, go away. <laughs> but thanks to a campaign uh, spearheaded by Leroy, Leroy McCarthy, mm-hmm. um, who also uh, did similar activism to get the landmarks named after the Wu-Tang Clan and uh, Notorious B.I.G., mm-hmm. New York City... The New York City Council just recently approved a measure to rename the Lower East Side Manhattan intersection, popularized on the Beastie Boys album, Paul's Boutique. Uh, it will be named Beastie Boys Square. Yeah. Just this, this anniversary just came up recently. It was July 25th of 1989 that the album came out. And I remember mm-hmm. this because I think I told you guys this story at some point in one episode. It's an infamous day or a day that will live in infamy for me because my friend and I had a job working part-time at a, <laughs> my, a company my mom worked for. Oh, It was a lighting company. <laughs> if I, if I told you this cat, I guess you're going to have to just pretend you never heard it before. Uh, <laughs> I know you didn't. We this were to install to lights in this showroom. Uh, okay. In the showroom because it was a lighting company. And uh-huh. uh, Light O'Lear was the company. I don't know if they're still around, but. Um, okay. It was being, this project was being headed up by a former vice president of the company who was also, I don't know, he knew enough about electricity, but he was retired, an elderly guy. And um, we, we didn't know what we were doing. We were 17, 18 years old, taking <laughs> wires. I don't know, the power was necessarily off. We're up on ladders, you know, it was insane. So my buddy says to me, because this is how our relationship works. You know, we're only getting paid like, I don't know, five bucks an hour. You should go to our boss here. Ask him for six bucks an hour. We're going to get killed. We're just kids. But we knew this guy had such a bad temper that we planned an escape route out of the building. Mm. We, we plot it out. We're going to go through these certain doors. We'll get out to the parking lot, back to my car, and we'll haul ass out of here. So I do ask for the six bucks. This guy starts screaming and cursing at me. You ungrateful son of a bitch. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm going to tell your mother. And he stormed off because my mother still worked there. We did our oh, escape yeah. plan. Mm-hmm. We got in a car. So he stormed and, off to go tell your mom. Is that yeah, what you oh, yeah. We stormed the hell out of there ourselves. <laughs> but what I knew was that day was July 25th, 1989, that the Beastie Boys new album was coming out. So we took what uh-huh. you know pittance we had already saved from this mm-hmm. summer job and drove over to mm-hmm. a record store, which was close by. Mm-hmm. And I spent all the money I had on this record uh, with this fold out. Nice. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> LP, uh, if you guys, CD, cassette. Oh, the, oh I had the, I had to have the vinyl. The album. The vinyl. The vinyl. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Vinyl. The, you know, it's like a threefold, mm-hmm. trifold. Mm-hmm. I got this one day one on CD because I was uh, yeah. I was nuts about CDs at the time. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who was I could it? see that. Mm-hmm. Was it CDs that you had in your truck? You had a CD player in your truck? I, that? I never had a CD player in my truck. No, it was, oh, I had one so CD player. Yeah, all cassettes that. in the truck. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. That's <laughs> what, right. Yep, yep, yep. What? Hollywood? You had a CD player in a vehicle <laughs> in 89? I, we did it. I had vinyl. I had a turntable in my truck. I could tell you a whole story about You're our radio You're scratching in the truck in the, in the back. Everybody's a DJ. <laughs> It's not too far off from my, my, the car we did have that we used to cruise. Oh God, it was, I'll tell you that some other time. <laughs> of course, the, the, the album wasn't well received at first. And I don't know why, because fans of the Beastie Boys loved it. And it's ultimately mm-hmm. looked at that back as, you know, the Sgt. Peppers of hip hop, because mm-hmm. it was just so innovative. It was such a break from their previous album, License to Ill. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was a, it was quite a, a stretch from what they had done in License to Ill, which was much more yeah. kind of like mainstream party music. And mm-hmm. yeah, Paul's yeah. Boutique, they just explored and did some amazing things sonically. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I know it, t- it took a little time to grow on me, but uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. I just listened to it last night. It was great. The whole album? <laughs> well, almost. I missed oh, a couple of songs. I had to go to bed. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> that's why I messaged you saying, I heard okay. a sample. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I knew you made it to the end of the first side, I guess, because it was Hey Lady or something you texted me. Right? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was just, I was like, I don't know why, where this is coming from. No, I was inspired by reading 1980s yeah. news. And the record was uh, produced by the Dust Brothers. It's it's primarily samples. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's almost essentially all samples. You couldn't make it today. We talked to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Professor KJ Green about this some time ago. You couldn't yeah. afford to pay all these licenses that people would expect money for. Now, it right. was going to be an instrumental. The Dust Brothers were going to uh, just produce this record of uh, tracks. And the Beastie Boys, my understanding was, were recording in the same building. And they just sort of got to chatting and heard some of the tracks. And were like, we should collaborate. And... Oh. The magic was born. Ultimately Very reached cool. number 14 on the U.S. Billboard and, and uh, U.S. Billboard Top Pop Albums and, and number 24 on the U.S. R&B Hip Hop Albums. It's mm-hmm. doubles, it's a certified double platinum as well. 
So is that photograph taken at that intersection no. or is that yes, why that location was selected? Okay. That's where Paul's boutique That's was. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then actually it turns out Paul's boutique is, it was not, that wasn't the actual store there. So I guess I will oh. tell you this. So they had this vision for this panoramic image they wanted to do, but they didn't know how to pull it off. So Mike Diamond approached a friend of theirs who had studied photography in college, uh, uh, Jeremy uh, Shatton. And he said, I can, I can do it. I'll even rent the cameras myself to, to pull it off. Um, the <laughs> mm-hmm. store was actually Lee's sportswear. And okay. what I didn't know about the uh, record certainly until recently was, so they, you know, they set dressed Lee's sportswear. They communicated with the mm-hmm. owner. They had a sign made that said Paul's Boutique. They redressed the store to look like Paul's Boutique. And in fact, ah. uh, in an interview with uh, Shatton, he pointed out that they, the stuff in front and outside of the store is stuff that they chose to go along with the aesthetic of the album, the sound, the, the kind of image that they were ultimately portraying. So he said something about like the disco shoes that are there, the banjo that's there, like all these things were hand picked by, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the beasties primarily led by uh, MCA because he was the the filmmaker of the, of the group. Okay. Right. Um, and mm-hmm. in fact, as a result of that, uh, Nathaniel Hornblower has a photography credit for the album, even though Jeremy Shatton actually took the picture. Mm-hmm. Nathaniel Hornblower's MCA's alter ego. Well, why is it called Paul's Boutique though? No, yeah, well, it turns out that Paul's Boutique is actually a reference to a real store that uh, was on a cassette that, that so uh, MCA, I believe, had a cassette where he recorded some music off the radio like you would, you know, when we were mm-hmm. kids in the Oh, 80s. yeah. And oh, one of yeah. the commercials was a guy advertising Paul's Boutique on there. In fact, okay. that clip is on but the That sample is in there. Come yeah. to oh. Paul's Boutique. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and cool. they're in Brooklyn. I didn't in Brooklyn. notice that. The okay. best yeah. in men's clothing. <laughs> Call up Paul's <laughs> Boutique. Yeah, and he gives out the phone number. That phone number again is 71. Yeah. So uh, that's where the name came from. Hey, and other non-related, uh, non-Beastie Boys related news, as reported by Ultimate Classic Rock, <laughs> William Shatner. This is the current incarnations of Star Trek. When I say by Ooh. current, it's like anything post Star Trek, the original series. <laughs> the original. <laughs> he has shat upon. I'm going to do that joke as many times as I can. How do you guys feel about that? It's Shatner. I mean, mm-hmm. <sighs> what he technically said was none of the current shows measure up to the original series is what he said. You know, they don't compare. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And Certainly none of the current shows are as iconic or as ingrained in pop culture as the original show, but you've had 50 years to get there. So give it, give it some time in the context. If you read the rest of his comments, he was really playing fast and loose. He sounded like he was a half drunk. He was, oh, so, okay. and he's dropping F bombs left and right yes. in it. And he's just oh, yeah. going, Oh, these things are crap or what? And I believe, I believe he even slags off star Wars in this thing yeah. with the exception of, but Mark yes. Hamill's okay. He's just, he's just right. on a tirade. <laughs> yeah. It's, and frankly, I, I don't think he's mm. watched anything other than, himself in God knows how long. I don't expect he's probably, subscribed yeah. to Paramount Plus. <laughs> yeah. He probably is most often watching himself in a mirror. <laughs> the very little I know about William Shatner that yeah. matches, yes. Mm-hmm. So of course, the original series ran from 66 to 69 and Shatner started as Kirk. Um, but uh, since then, we've had a slew of a number of different products. Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation was, I guess, that might have been the, f- well, we had the animated series. So I guess in contemporary mm-hmm. times. Uh, Next Generation, you had Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, more recently you had Discovery, and Picard, which is a spinoff of Next Generation, and of course the most recent entry is Strange New Worlds, which John and I have talked about. We both love that Mm -hmm. show. Wonderful. Um, You're letting him a little bit off the hook because one of his quotes was, uh, well, they asked him whether any current shows match, and he said none, or which of them match? He said none of them. I got to know Gene Roddenberry in three years fairly well. He'd be turning in his grave. <laughs> that, he'd be turning at his grave at some of these things, right? Yeah. yeah. And I don't oh, know Shatner's political leanings, but I think we've all heard the, you know, I can't believe how woke Star Trek is by those who yes. never watched Star Trek to find out that it was always right. on the leading edge right. of political commentary and equality. Yes. So that I do know. Right. <laughs> yes. So it's like when yeah. uh, circa 1966 is when dumbass, right? That's, it's always yeah. been that way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, Roddenberry rolling in his grave. Uh, 
If you know anything about Gene Roddenberry, he was also a very myopic kind of guy that believed that there should be no conflict between the characters anywhere inside of the series. And it wasn't Mm. until he passed away that successors were able to expand the dramatic scope of Star Trek and make things like the later seasons, the next generation and everything else that's come since then. So, you know, Roddenberry rolling in his grave is not necessarily a horrible thing. (laughs) (laughs) And while different shows that I mentioned each diverge somewhat from the formula of the original strange new worlds as we met is, is, is seems to return certainly mostly Mm -hmm. to the introspective nature, the pace, the social commentary of the classic series that, you know, that, um, that we love. And Mm -hmm. maybe not surprisingly, therefore, according to uh, Rotten Tomatoes, the review aggregator site, the new series Stranger, uh, Strange New Worlds is a, has a higher rating above all Star Trek, including mm-hmm. the original series. Wow. Yeah. It currently holds a 99% yeah. rating. Now, they've only had to sustain that across 10 episodes, but the fact yep. that they did sustain it across <laughs> 10 episodes, you know, you have the, the mm-hmm. sophomore slump, they have a second season coming, but still, it's damn yeah. amazing. And in fact, one of the actors off of Strange New Worlds, Melissa Navia, on Twitter, yeah. she she fired back pretty hard at the the Shatner faithful and kind of, it kind of put him, really? put him, in, put him in a certain light. that was like, yeah, the kind of people that think this probably do agree with Shatner and they're self-identifying. So <laughs> <laughs> I see you. We see I, you. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, mm-hmm. but I love Melissa mm-hmm. Navia on Twitter. If you're not following her, she's amazing. She yeah. plays uh, Erica Ortega on strange new world. She's yeah, yeah not a clunker in the bunch. They're all great. Uh, okay, hey, finally, in, in, in 1980s news, the secret is out. Hopper wielded a secret 1980s power during his D&D combat. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is a minor spoiler. Oh. Okay, minor spoiler for season four of Stranger Things. Look, it's only minor in the sense that you know at some point someone's finding a Demogorgon. Uh, yep. Otherwise, you know there's Demogorgons right. and there's Hopper. So there's a scene where he fights one. Mm-hmm. There you go. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that because uh, during this particular scene, um, it takes place in a Russian prison where they have a gladiatorial uh, arena set up mm-hmm. inside uh, mm-hmm. where the prisoners are forced to fight against the Demogorgon, which if you don't know, is one of the elite monsters from the netherworld of the series. Um, An elite the, monster. I like the elite monster. Yes. It's like, you know, <laughs> well, again, it might, might be too spoilery to get in the idea that they I feel like they retconned this and they're talking about how there's probably ranks and you know, so-and-so is a general and this other, all right, right. Where's the Demogorgons? Where'd they go? You can go to the upside down now. There's no Demogorgons anymore. Monster junior grade or poor. The (laughs) Demogorgon has like a helmet on. His his, his little cap. With those hands. Yeah. Then he opens his mouth and the hat just falls off. (laughs) He, He eats the hat. It's delicious. Oh, but the yeah, fights yeah. were led to believe or, or to keep the Demogorgons alive because, you know, like a predator, they, if it's mm-hmm. not hunting, they said, you mm-hmm. know, to may lose the lust for, for life. <laughs> anyway, and the Russians, meanwhile, are trying to keep these Demogorgons alive because they're trying to ultimately want to weaponize them, it seems. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, so instead of fighting a fair fight, the prisoners are given me- melee weapons only. Mm-hmm. Um, including one familiar sword. David Harbour, who plays Hopper, uh, took to Instagram to reveal the weapon's origins, writing, Nerd Alert! The prop at the end of episode nine is the actual sword used in filming in the filming of both Conan films. Conan films. Conan, <laughs> Conan the Barbarian. Conan, Conan. O'Brien. Conan, Conan films. Conan. Not yeah. Conan O'Brien. Conan yeah, I know, right? Conan the Barbarian. I, I've seen for Conan <laughs> O'Brien so many more times now. It was heavy as hell and such a tremendous honor to wield. Schwarzenegger, ready to accept your notes on my technique. <laughs> I got to admit, I didn't recognize it. I didn't even think twice of it. It did seem odd that they had this really ornate sword in the middle of this prison, though, compared right, to the other right. weapons that were available. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing I it really cool. and thinking, yeah. that looks like a cool, like, 80s era barbarian kind of sword because it was very ornate. <laughs> I certainly yeah. at no point thought, not only is this like the sword, that yeah. this is the sword mm-hmm. from the sword. Conan the right. Barbarian Destroyer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, in the films, Schwarzenegger held this, what they refer to as the Atlantean sword, because there's a couple swords in the first film, certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he uses this one ultimately in the in 81's Conan and the 84's sequel, Conan the Destroyer. Conan the Destroyer. Um, mm-hmm. Both, of course, were inspired by the uh, pulp stories uh, from Robert E. Howard. In the film, Conan finds this particular sword in a crypt in the skeletal remains of a, an ancient warrior, I guess an mm. Atlantean warrior. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I did do some digging into the sword because, you know, it's, it's, it occurs to me, you know, uh, David Harbour said, this is heavy. So this wasn't the foam, mm-hmm. a foam sword that would be made for a stunt guy to hit somebody with or do flips with or something, something that would require, you know, extra danger. Mm-hmm. It was the metal sword. How, to my surprise, it's like, how has this thing survived in what appears to be great condition for 30 years? Right. No, no, no. Yeah. Where was it? So Some it prop master that, in Hollywood had this probably, right? Well, yeah, you know, I don't know who had it, but I could okay. tell you where how it was made. And it's, I guess, no surprise. It's a real sword. Uh, mm-hmm. The sword weight, I'm sorry, the sword was designed mm-hmm. by production designer Ron Cobb. Uh, the handle was sculpted by the prop master who was uh, hired for the film, Tim, Tim mm-hmm. Huck. Huckhausen, I'm going to say. And the blade was forged by master blade maker Jody Sampson. Mm. Uh, the sword weighed eight and a half pounds, although a real sword generally only weighs about two and a half pounds, so it could actually be swung around during combat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the sword blades were made out of 440 steel and was heat treated. Oh, I don't know all that. Um, it was 27 <laughs> inches long, the blade itself. When you throw in the handle, it was 36 and a half inches long. <laughs> yep. When I see Schwarzenegger swinging around, it seems like no problem, you know? It could only have been better if Hopper said something offhanded to the Demogorgon about the lamentation of his women after he just decimated oh him, God. right? <laughs> then I would have picked up on oh, the right. sword. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, of course, there's a number of other Stranger Things products on the way because this season has been so successful with more than 1 billion hours already consumed. Yikes. Uh, Netflix has signed a deal with the Duffer Brothers, who created it, to helm multiple uh, Stranger Things, uh, you know, tangent uh, projects, uh, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. including a spinoff, which we don't know what that's going to be, but it seems like Hawkins is... Uh, Going to be a part of our future. Mm-hmm. All right. Hey, that was 1980s. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason. And this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, We've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we are finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. You can find the All 80s Movies Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. Please subscribe and happy listening. I have a button today. You have a button? That was easy. (laughs) Why do you have that? Why are you bringing props? I don't know. It's like when you pulled the the Viewmaster out, like out of nowhere that time. I was like, hey guys, thinking of Viewmasters, you mean like this? (laughs) There's the Viewmaster. You still have it there? (laughs) It just lives here. It's so bizarre. I don't, I don't oh. have, I have, I have a Rubik's cube. I mean, what kind of prop could I possibly, I don't know. Yeah. I, I have, do you have any Play-Doh? Cause I do. Oh, John's smelling his Play-Doh. He's smelling the Play-Doh. That's why I have it. To smell it. Does it relax you? You know, the, the, the olfactory uh, connection. Or invigorate you. Back memories. Oh, yeah. Man. So look, as we mentioned earlier today, we're going to be talking about Six toys from the 1980s with horrifying backstories. And this was inspired by an article on Cracked uh, from a few years ago. And mm-hmm. we've discussed this many times. I recall talking with John about this on at least two different episodes. And I think it was when John was first on our show, actually. How I think so. Yeah, we were talking um, well, about some cartoons, actually, that were... Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, and really, in, I guess, how because of the deregulation of, uh, you know, television... Uh, in the 1980s, because the Reagan White House and the toy manufacturers and the, you know, <laughs> were putting pressure to them to, for for them to the FCC to deregulate television so they could advertise to children. Yep. <laughs> I mean, we, we talked about it. Said you can't. Yeah, we talked about this back oh, then man. that they used Saturday morning cartoons, any cartoons, yeah. honestly, all cartoons, mm-hmm. to as another method of advertising toys. Like it used to be, just you'd do a comic book line. Or used to be, yep. you, you mm-hmm. just do a, a store display, but now you do a whole cartoon. But I mean, that was the He-Man model, right? right. They made the cartoon yeah. first 
to sell the toys. It wasn't the other way around. Right. And, yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. at that point, then you've got 30 minute commercials where these, cause John's pointing out the cartoon is just an infomercial for the toy. <laughs> uh, and in some instances that we're going to talk about today, they created really the toy <laughs> stories for these toys. I mean, they certainly did. <laughs> like if a parent ever peeked in on some of these, he'd be like, well, what is this? Now, again, we learned last week that parents didn't pay attention to anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I was reading some of these, I was thinking some frustrated science fiction author got his first opportunity yep. to make a Saturday cartoon. He's like, I want to put the twisted <laughs> shit. I want to put my sci-fi into this goofy cartoon. <laughs> and they did. I some, yeah. I think some of the writers may not have liked children. <laughs> you can't blame them. Yeah. I mean, they had a chance to create any type of story, but instead of going with something that, uh, you know, uh, thoughtful and maybe creative and nuanced. They just took the tales to really bizarre, dark places. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. can't be my little pony. I know you're big brony, Will, but it's, you got some, yeah, some I, variation. I take this off. I, by the way, I can take this thing off. I can't <laughs> wear this anymore. It's just, it's the big horse head. Which one is oh, that? Actually, is hey, that? I'm going to flutterfly. Which shutterfly, which please. Shutterfly. Oh, shutterfly. Uh, correction. It's <laughs> shutterfly. Yeah, it's Shutterfly. That's why I was. <laughs> All right. I'm going to tell you about one here. Um, the Cabbage Patch Kids. Okay. And actually, mm -hmm. you know, we did talk about this briefly many episodes ago, but in the yeah, context of something else, because I had come across this article then. Mm -hmm. um, of course, look, folks on this, listening to this show don't know the Cabbage Patch Kids, but maybe what you don't appreciate, uh, others maybe, that, you know, rioting over popular toys uh, these days <laughs> seems like, a, you know, a staple of holiday shopping, but like many things that we celebrate today. It was born in the 1980s, including, the, you know, going crazy over yeah. dumb shit. So when Cabbage Patch Kids <laughs> hit the shelves in 1983, <laughs> stores were not prepared, prepared for this madness. No. Uh, mm -hmm. They had thousands of customers arriving at Bradley's and Sears and Kmart with only hundreds of dolls available to each mm -hmm. store. So there was no chance mm -hmm. everybody was making away with what was becoming the most popular toy. Um, mm -hmm. So in 1984, determined not to be, you know, have this problem again, Coleco not only produced more of these god-awful, ugly infants, but <laughs> the toy company also licensed others to produce storybooks, cassettes, you know, animated TV shows, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The result was sheer madness. Uh, because <laughs> first off, by the way, Cabbage Patch was, was Brussels sprout Baby's not available. I mean, cabbage. No, but I don't have a good so association with. Well, my, I, I love a good coleslaw. Actually, that's not true. Oh, but otherwise, nice. I don't know. Yeah, Brussels um, sprout babies does have better alliteration. Yeah, there you go. Brussels yeah, sprout babies. yeah. Uh, but in addition yeah. to just being a terrible trademark, it, it, Cabbage Patch Kids actually describes their origin because they're grown in cabbages. <laughs> so. Uh, Granted, you probably don't want to, you know, break it to a kid uh, how, where babies really come from, but you can probably just leave that whole part out. As most animated shows don't go to the lengths to explain, you know, uh, procreation, <laughs> I think. Um, yep. But it keeps getting weirder because the, the magical cabbages are actually pollinated by mutated creatures called bunny bees who drop <laughs> crystals on them. Oh, dropping crystals <laughs> all over your cabbage. Mm. Oh no! Don't Google that. There's some kind of video that'll come so, up. It's so inappropriate. No doubt. My favorite no Pornhub category. <laughs> I don't know. The kids <laughs> then emerge into the world with no parents. They're basically left to fend for themselves until they're adopted. So these kids are born in a plant in a in a farm, uh, <laughs> in a field, in a field, <laughs> and they have to be adopted quick because. Nearby, unfortunately, there's a gold mine that's owned by the evil Lavender McDade. <laughs> whose business plan <laughs> is not to find people to adopt these babies. Because if Lavender knew how popular these things would be, she could just sell these kids straight, you know. Oh yeah. Have you seen the secondary market? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. At a toy, at a Toys R Us, you know. The, but instead, no. What Lavender's going to do is kidnap the Cabbage Patch kids. And, and this, again, this is the story <laughs> that we're telling to our kids. You're not making this up, no. <laughs> She's going to turn the Cabbage Patch kids into slaves to work her minds. Quick, and there's buy a, them at the yeah. store before they become slaves. <laughs> Motivation. Commercial. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, in Lavender describes your plan in an album uh, of Cabbage Patch songs that, uh, you know, 
support oh. the story she sings. Uh, I don't know the melody, Cat. I didn't memorize it, so I'll just tell you. It. Oh. <laughs> I've got to stop those Cabbage Patch kids from finding parents of their own. I'm going to need some henchmen. I can't do it all alone because there's gold here in the valley and the kids cannot go free. I need their little fingers to dig the gold for me. I ain't saying she's a gold digger. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Mm. But he's for sale at the Kmart. Yeah. Mm. 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 I'm paraphrasing. So not only we get doing away with uh, laws that protect our children from commercials, child labor laws out the window too. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like adopt this puppy before we kill it. Buy this doll before I put it in the gold yeah. mines. <laughs> it's like that National Lampoon cover with the gun to a dog's head. Exactly. Yep. Oh, no. yeah. mm. All right. That's enough of uh. cabbage patch. Yeah, okay. Yeah, about I got one for you. Yeah. And yeah. this is one that we talked, we talked about the cartoon on that previous episode, but okay, yeah. we didn't really del. We talked about how weird the cartoon was, but we didn't really talk about how just batshit crazy the concept <laughs> for, <laughs> and I'm talking about <laughs> sectars. It's actually sectars, oh. warriors of symbion for some oh, reason. Geez, but yeah. these, if, <laughs> if you remember the, the action figures were, and the cartoon, they, they look like people, but they have like mm. single color eyes and antenna sticking out of their forehead. And, oh. and they're, uh, yeah, the, the, the whole idea is that, that it's this cross. They want to do a mashup of something that hadn't been done before. You know, he man was out there and GI <laughs> Joes were out there. We're like, how about bugs? Kids love bugs, right? Let's do people bugs. <laughs> and it was, we, we talked about before, before that promotion, they, every toy had a mini comic book in it. And plus they had, a, like Marvel did a short series, a full, full-size full comic book series about the sectars. Uh, yeah. But 85 is when Coleco, again, Coleco with their nuttiness, yeah. they <laughs> they were, all the figures were insect-like and they had, if you bought the guy, he had a companion bug of some kind and each one had a cool different power. Like one could squirt water and one had a like a oh, string right. in him, like a yo-yo yes. string. So he had like a web he could just climb with. I remember those and, commercials oh. now. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, there was even. It's kind of weird though. Like, <laughs> bugs are riding other bugs. So why aren't some bugs are no it, hybrids? I'm, and I'll explain. I'm gonna get there. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, all yeah. right. They even had vehicle. There was a vehicle. Vehicles. I'm using loosely. It was a yeah. hand puppet with fuzz on it with a oh, saddle. Yes. And you put your guy oh. and your hand was the spider, and you were riding. I totally it. wanted that. It was, it was yes. bananas. Yeah. Okay. But nice. None of that stacks up to the craziness behind Sectar's Warriors of Symbion. So mm. the legend is, and this is all in the cartoon, which by the way, ran a whopping yeah. five, five count them episodes. Oh, <laughs> that was it. Before the police arrived at the right. TV station yeah. and arrested everybody. So <laughs> thousands of years ago, there was a peaceful planet full of enlightened beings called the ancients whose scientific advances had fostered the perfect utopia. I don't know why it's a perfect utopia. Wrong. I mean, utopia by definition oh. is perfect. But <laughs> yeah, right. Redundant. Anyway, it's, it's <laughs> redundant. Utopia. Anyway, until one day something went terribly wrong. The whole planet was almost entirely destroyed by an unknown yeah. biological disaster. Hmm. Hmm. From the ashes of the ruined planet rose a race of animal insect mutants who are in perpetual state of war. Oh. You know, this is kind of what we were warned as kids would happen, though, right? You're going to have a nuclear holocaust and people yeah, are going to mutate. Yeah. The nuttiest twist is yeah. why are they at yeah. war? Mm. Well, yeah. well, the ancients who caused this, caused the utopia to be ruined. Oh. Why? They, they could have fixed it. They didn't. Yeah. Instead, they hid their knowledge of how to repair the planet oh. in these things called hives. Hive with a Y, H-Y-V-E, because it's nutty. And let the two warring <laughs> factions fight to claim the secrets of the ancients to fix the planet. Assholes. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> giggles. What? I know. Uh, yeah. First of Perfect all, was boring. I, they needed to, to jazz things up a little. I, yeah. I love how it's hives, a Hama phone, right? A Hama phone for hives. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't written on a screen. You heard, only heard them exactly. saying it probably well, in the cartoon. Well, in the bother? comic book, they probably spelled it weird because it's edgy. Oh, it's hives. Right. Yeah, 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 probably. Yeah, yeah. So I, the moral, honestly, is if the world is perfect, stop doing science. Just quit. Stop. No more because you're going to screw something up. <laughs> You know, look, I guess as a kid, I'm trying to remember if I played with bugs. Probably when you're younger, you play with certain bugs. But bugs reach a certain level or size mm -hmm. of disgustingness mm -hmm. to me that I wouldn't want to play with them. It is too much. I'm not afraid of bugs. I handle them. I'm the bug wrangler in my house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. These things mm -hmm. are, I looked again at these figures to talk about this today. They're just gross looking to me. They, they are, yeah. Know, just some awful. So ultimately, biological disaster and let the yeah. warring factions fight for the 
cure that we already have. Go nuts. Kat, you can tell yeah. us something. I am. I probably have too much on the hug a bunch, but <laughs> is there, can there to be too you, much on the hug a bunch? There I, can, there I can. watched oh, it. God, I watched oh God, this. Kat, no. I did. I was so curious. Okay. So the hug a bunch, which I never had one of, but yeah. it was a, you know, a bunch I remember of these. It by name oh, pretty much. Yeah. Only. Okay. I don't even know if I knew the name, but they were cute. Apparently plush no. dolls meant for hugging. Mm. You know, that's their claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> the hug a bunch and a special, a TV special uh, was released in 1985 <laughs> starring, um, hug a, some hug a bunch, but it was a main character of this TV special yep. named Bridget. Okay. Oh. So Bridget mm. is a young girl living yep. with her parents, a really bratty older brother, mm. and her beloved grandmother, uh, with whom Bridget has a really strong bond, like yep. really strong bond. They're tight. Okay. And Bridget learns that this really functioning perfectly fine, maybe just a little forgetful, but has all of her wits about her grandmother yeah. is going to be sent to a nursing home by this her parents. This is a kid's oh. show? Wow. This is a kid's show. This is a kid's show. She's going to be sent <laughs> to a nursing home by the parents and this yeah. really Where she'll become a slave elite. digging for gold. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> yeah, wait, is this the origin story of Lavender McDade? <laughs> the old woman who's losing her mind? So, in fact, the adults talk about this in front of the grandmother who has all of her wits about her. Like she's some kind of difficult family pet. Yeah. And Bridget, not quite understanding at first what they're di discussing, asks her horrible brother for an explanation. And he says, they're putting her out to pasture. <laughs> <laughs> and when that, that phrasing is a little puzzling to Bridget, yeah. <laughs> she's like, what does that mean? He further elaborates, like a horse who's too old for anything. So they just put him in a field, let him eat and enjoy their life until they die. <laughs> in the show. This is in the show. <laughs> so that's stressful, right? For Bridget. Yeah. yeah. Then concurrently, <laughs> she has this, uh, she experiences uh, this mystery in the form of eerie giggling coming from her bedroom closet. Whenever she hugs one of her Stuffed animal toys. So this okay. is a horror horror movie or horror show? <laughs> Might as well be. Oh, and on the same day that Bridget learns about them kicking the grandmother out, yeah. basically, they're ditching grandma, she witnesses uh, a murder? <laughs> it's gotta be a murder. <laughs> That's where this is going. <laughs> she witnesses a stuffed child humanoid toy creature emerging from her closet. Through oh the mirror. God. Okay. Nuke it from orbit. <laughs> Just <laughs> absolutely. And Chucky again. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and this thing is named Huggins. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't that the informant on Starsky and Hutch, right? Huggins? Yeah. No. Oh, different Huggy. <laughs> Great Sorry. dresser, yes. And so then Bridget learns that Huggins, <laughs> uh, plus whoever knows how many other creatures like her, have been watching Bridget <gasps> through the mirror of her closet Jesus, for a long holy time. Mother of Pearl. Huggins says this for a long time. We've been watching you. <laughs> they hug each other lots and lots for a while, like immediately after Without this. Consent. Is, is that a euphemism for something? <laughs> <laughs> the hug a bunch. Huggin' bunch, air quotes. Mm, yeah. So Bridget confides mm. in Huggins about the grandma issue, <laughs> the grandma getting tossed out, and they decide that grandma needs to get younger. Okay. That, that's their, their first solution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because then she won't need to be kicked out, I guess. So, so Huggins is the problem, yeah. <laughs> Huggins suggests they travel through <laughs> the mirror. <laughs> the one that the Huggins have been spying on her uh, through. And wrong? into Huggaland to go find, go collect some young berries and feed them to the grandma. It's right in uh, the name. And <laughs> the only way to get to the young berry. <laughs> Did you say it's right in the name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the There's young berries. Way. Okay. There's one young berry tree and it's protected by the evil queen in the land of the shrugs. There's so many hugs and shrugs. On this thing. It's the uh, opposite of hugs is yeah. shrugs. It's, right. It has to be. Oh, yeah. it's mm. All this stuff. So he tells them to get there. They have to jump down this terrifying, endless, fiery hole to the never bottom. Oh, yikes. They have to somehow get. <laughs> they, they have to somehow get past a hairy behemoth. Okay. Cross the sea of broken glass. <laughs> this is 
Greek now they're just mythology. making stuff up. They're just like <laughs> and then steal steal the berries. Oh, and they need to make sure the young berries <laughs> don't touch the ground, otherwise they disappear. You have to burn them then. Yeah. A little foreshadowing there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try and guess how they defeat the behemoth, the hairy behemoth. They shave him. <laughs> they shave him with the broken glass. Yes. Take, <laughs> utilizing your environment. That's genius. It's got to be the power of hugs. Oh, it is. That's, it oh. is. It's, it's the power of hugs. Ugh. And then it turns into like this odd blue Frankenstein elephant named Hod Podge. <laughs> they hug him but to a bloody pulp. <laughs> yes. Originally, it's this like steaming, multi tusked, woolly mammoth. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's crazy. That's all right. They that's Will's second favorite category on you born to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> or oh, number no, three. Yeah, I can't no, keep okay. them straight. Yeah, no, I gotta find that. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. Okay. First one was hug so a bunch. They, no, second one. <laughs> they, get, <laughs> they finally meet the queen who is not willing to share. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> not, not willing to share these berries, which keep her looking young and alive. Bridget mm. gets frozen into a statue. They unfreeze Bridget with guess. Hugs. Hugs. A hug. And then oh. while the queen is distractedly admiring herself, they steal all of the ripe young berries, like all of them. Mm. So the queen catches them in the act, but she's too late. And we watch her shrivel up, turn gray and die. Mm. Oh my God. So wow. they murdered, they straight up murdered that old lady. Yes, they did. So oh. this well, whole thing raises a question, though, like whether that like, queen's life was more or less valuable than her grandmother's life. It, it does raise mm. that question. Absolutely. Will, Will. Can, I, can I have a quick sidebar, Will? I yeah, think yeah, yeah. somebody cat, sprinkled yeah. crystal on cat. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds, bear this sounds like a bunny... drugged fever dream. <laughs> I didn't make any of this up. Honestly, I John, I it. think this is a result of watching this cartoon. Mm. <laughs> it just like reprogrammed her. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sending shrugs your way. Mm. <laughs> Oh, uh, shrugs. You, the, shrugs. you gotta defeat it with power shrugs. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about this whole thing. <laughs> Mammoth hairy beast. I will hug you to a pulp. So does Bridget make it back? I gotta wrap this up. Yes, they make it back. They go return through her mirror and mirror and shockingly she trips and falls and all the berries spill on the floor. Oh, son they of disappear. a bitch. After all that. So the whole, the whole, so the whole show was a waste of time. Pointless. Yes. Yeah. It was pointless right and then i just have to Jesus. I'm, I'm wrapping up here the, the this is the quote from the article finding herself as the star in what is apparently a goddamn shakespearean tragedy <laughs> <laughs> bridget decides to take the only course remaining to her and threatens yeah. never to speak to her brother again unless he starts showing some affection to grandma i think bridget ran face first into the mirror knocked herself out and had a concussion yeah, nightmare right. there you go. and woke up going <laughs> oh the damn young berries oh no yeah <laughs> no those are your teeth pick those up i pray i pray that's what the explanation is well wow. bridget has no clout in this house whatsoever nobody yeah. believes her about anything because apparently the brother does get inspired by bridget refusing to speak to him mm -hmm. he states that he loves grandma and he doesn't want her to leave and that is somehow the thing that inspires the parents to say oh you're right we'll oh keep God. grandma oh Even someone loves her okay so you can live so <laughs> and the kid so that means like the the, the kid loves the the parents i mean that's their one of their parents mm -hmm. yeah the mother yep. or father's mother it's the father's mother so the yes. kid loves them more than the father loves her. I don't know. This is weird. I know. It's, it's terrible. Um, this, this show was nominated oh. or won an Emmy for outstanding special visual effects. Oh, not for the oh story. Okay, <laughs> good. No, not for the story. But some of the little things were kind of clever. See, see how you wiggled your fingers? You know? It's because of its power to hypnotize. That was mm -hmm. the effect, the, fit, the, uh, the yep. effect. <laughs> Man. Well, that's. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for uh, humoring me. With you know, that. you know, actually, it's funny that you tell us such a cr batshit crazy story because that reminds me. <laughs> Once again, it's time to play. Yeah. You gotta be fucking kidding. <laughs> so I came across this book and doing research for this episode. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to find more toys to talk about. And I came across this book called Turmoil in the Toy Box, which was written by mm. Phil Phillips in 1986. Mm. And, wow. uh, it, it was, I think it first began as a, a conversation, as a sort of a faux interview between Phil Phillips and I, think, I believe a pastor in 1984. 
in the sort of, I guess I don't want to say the height of the satanic panic because it, it was probably sort of waning at that point, but mm-hmm. certainly caught up in the, you know, the riptide, the ebb and flow of that, you know, it was still. So I'm going to present to you guys okay. uh-huh. some th- ways that they describe some of our favorite uh, toys slash, oh. slash oh. shows. Okay. okay. we got five of them right. for you here. And I want to All see right. if you can guess what they're talking about based on okay. their beliefs about this show. I mean, this mm. is not like conjecture. They were certain uh, about the satanic influences of these, you know, properties that we love. Right. Okay. okay. Gosh. All uh, right. Uh, so I got five of them here. So I guess you could just shout it out if you get, get the thing here. All right. So here we go from the <laughs> book, uh, toy, Turmarlin Toy Box. The chief promoter of the occult in the series, whose face is a skull, carries a ram's head uh, staff, which oh. is used in occult practices. He man. Are the masters of the the universe. That's what I was trying to think of. Masters of the universe. (laughs) All right, here's another one for you. Uh, Many forms of the occult are contained in this cartoon. Oh. Every time the characters have a problem, they turn to their leader who who whips up a spell or recites an incantation to help them out. Oh. I'll give you another clue if you don't have it yet. In one episode, the villain, an evil wizard. I have a guess. I have a guess. Okay. Yep. I do too. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kat. I, I guessed last time. Go ahead. Let's see if we'll say it at the same time. Ready? Okay. Yep. The Smurfs. Smurfs. That's it. Hey. That was easy. <laughs> we got a parallel podcast going on. Here. Uh, <sighs> is John huffing the hug a bunch? What was that's, going on there? That's my reward. <laughs> in one episode, this is another quote from the uh, book about the Smurfs. In one episode, the villain, an evil wizard, drew a pentagram on the floor and lit candles at each point. You he bet. danced within the pentagram while chanting a spell. This is an actual witchcraft practice, and millions of children watched. Oh, hmm. that is true. That did happen in an episode. Yep. So it was um, in one episode. Yeah, old Gargamel. Huh. And by the way, I went down a deep rabbit hole about the occult theories uh, folks have about the Smurfs. Really? Holy shit. There's a whole, oh my God. We could do an episode on this. Papa Smurf wow. wears red. He looks like communist Karl Marx. I don't know if that has to do with anything. Uh, I think this is a future episode. In the interview sure. I referred to that these, these guy, this guy has, uh, before he did the book, it was just like in this conversation mm-hmm. that they videotape. Mm-hmm. They just refer to the Smurfs as undead. They believe they're undead creatures because they're blue. Because they're blue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lack of oxygen. <laughs> He'll do it to you. All right. Uh, here you go. Here's another one <sighs> from gosh, the book, uh, Turmoil in the Toy Box. Mm-hmm. While many of the characters look like ordinary horses, some are portrayed as unicorns. Others have wings. Yeah. The we, unicorn we is the symbol of the Antichrist, which the prophet Daniel described in his vision as the little horn, which rises in the midst of the ten horns. <laughs> <laughs> We got this cat, right? Are you doing cat? Should we say it at the same time? Yeah. Oh, One, <laughs> two, three. My, My little, little pony. pony. There you go. <laughs> John, I was waiting for you to say that show with the, uh, what was that, like half horse, half man guy? Remember that with, oh, oh Brave Star. Yeah, oh. right. Brave Star. <laughs> That's another thing where a guy rides his friend. Yeah. In the cartoon. <laughs> sometimes a guy, and sometimes a horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, here's another one. Despite concern that the toy emphasizes physical perfection in an unrealistic manner, the manufacturer insists it teaches some valuable lessons to youngsters, such as fastening seatbelts and good grooming habits. It would it. be far better for the child to play with a regular baby doll and Got pretend it. to be a mother. Um, yeah. I'm thinking we both have this, ready? I think we do, yeah. Barbie. Barbie. Oh, <laughs> I thought this was interesting because they bemoan the whole thing about, you know, Barbie setting these beauty standards that you can't reach. But ultimately, they conclude that kids should just pretend to be mothers. Just get knocked up. That's better. <laughs> right. There you go. Although not a religion per se. Again, this is a product slash cartoon from the 1980s. Oh, wait. Uh-huh. It does teach religious principles. And f- <laughs> John is huffing Plato, by the way. Yes, he, is. he really is. That, that's not the joke. Although Why would not you a religion say that about se, me? It does teach, I have a video, it does teach religious principles and familiarize players with the terms and rituals of occult forms of religion. Uh, Okay. Finally stumped you guys. Yeah. No, I I think I know. Oh, John's got it. Okay. Go for it. I don't know. I have it. I have a guess. Yeah. Well, you try it. Yeah. I think you're talking about TSR's Dungeons and Dragons. That's right. Oh, 
I didn't think of that as toys. I thought of it like it popped into my head, but I, you know, you know I wasn't I think, thinking that was either, thinking but it, it and stuff. fits yeah. so well that I'm like, it's gotta yeah, be. It does. It's gotta yeah, be. It does. Yeah. 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 Nice. All right. Hey, <laughs> this is already a long show. What was I, what was I doing with this? <laughs> all right. Can we just get through these or, well, I mean, maybe yeah. I shouldn't yes. have played the game, go. but. All right, here we go. Hey, no, the game is so I got we got a couple, we got three more here and then we'll wrap up. So uh, I want to talk to you about PJ Sparkles. This is another one that I remember by name and I remember what it looked Mm -hmm. like because I saw it online, but I I don't know anybody who actually had one. And maybe because it was Mm -hmm. made later in the 80s and we were already sort of aged out of Mm -hmm. interest in toys and our our peers and our siblings. But it was a doll made in the late 80s by Mattel and it it was still being made into the early 1990s. It was a doll that featured flashing lights as well as a dress that could turn into a nightgown. In the commercial, they show a girl sleeping with it. I don't know how she could sleep with it because it's just flickering and it's like, it, it's trying to fall asleep in the middle of a dis, you know, studio <laughs> right before. Uh, in any other decade, that alone would be enough to sell the doll. I mean, the doll lights up. I mean, that'd be amazing, yep. you know? Yeah, right. Boy or girl yeah. would want something like that. It's pretty cool. But not in the 1980s because this doll's, you know, competing with the LSD uh, induced origins of the other toys that we've already gone through on this list. (laughs) So no, instead you need something like out of a David Cronenberg film. Uh, And the manufacturers included a VHS tape with the doll that uh, explained the toy's mythology. The short film tells (laughs) of PJ, who's an orphan who wishes on a star. By the way, it's the shittiest wishing star of all because this thing, (laughs) it's so ineffective. It started fine. Wish on a star. Okay. That's a great start. That sounds great. Where are we going? So PJ uh-huh. wishes for someone to love. And instead of just taking this orphan and giving her a caring, stable home, you know, with humans. <laughs> no, she has mm-hmm. to be transported to like the land of the hug a bunch. Because <laughs> oh, no. the, the wishing star takes her to Twinkle Town, which uh. despite its <laughs> cheerful name, the kids point this out. Nothing twinkles or sparkles there. It's dark. It's dingy. It's polluted. Uh. The kids are all like in brown and gray hues. Their clothing is, you know, tattered. Um, and there's no apparent <laughs> order to coming. it. Uh, at first, we don't know of any adults. And these kids are not loved. It turns out that they're, they've they also been wishing on the star for someone to love them. But they've oh. been wishing on it for like decades. <laughs> so this, I'm saying this wishing star, it, it has its power, but it, it does it only after this. Pe- whatever. Okay, whatever. <laughs> my my magic great. power is wait until somebody else wishes a wish that matches the first wish and then act yeah. like I granted two damn wishes. Yeah. <laughs> then it's a game of concentration or something. Uh. Um, so the kids realize, hey, this is the one we've been wishing for. And she's like, hey, and you're the ones I've been wishing for. So from there, it's like we, John said about one of the other stories. It just seems like the writers are just riffing. Oh. Um, and in fact, at some points, the characters are asking uh, PJ, uh, what the, what's going on? Like, where'd you come from? All this stuff. And now her mm-hmm. horse, oh, by the way, I forgot she has a horse that also transported with her. Her horse oh, now cool. talks mm-hmm. and her horse makes these asides like, don't worry about it. We don't know either. Or <laughs> don't ask too many questions. <laughs> I mean, it's like this meta commentary on the fact that the writers didn't fill in enough of the blanks for themselves even. <laughs> yeah, the horse at one point whispers, just go with it, kiddo. It would take too long to explain. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so then the just villains finally, it right over. And also, <laughs> let's keep this between us and don't tell any adults. <laughs> just oh go with God, it. Just kidding. <laughs> oh. It turns out there's two villains in the story who are the only adults, uh, a man and his wife, who carry around a sack that literally says filth on it. it just, <laughs> they want the place to be dingy and dirty. And when PJ Sparkles shows up, you know, everything starts getting brighter and more colorful. I forgot to mention Welcome that. to Twinkle Town, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, it's a shit, it's a shit, whatever, yeah. Shit town, oh. shit storm. Oh, yeah. We're cursing a lot today. Oh. Um, you so are. they're really upset because, uh, you know, her, her presence, PJ, is turning this world upside down. She's bringing color and mm-hmm. love and happiness. So now they start to overthrow her efforts with their filth. Uh, I, mm. I'm going to cut out a bunch of stuff to make this story very simple. Because PJ goes on this little side quest and leaves their world. Uh-huh. Okay. I guess I should say that. When she comes back, the world is back to being terrible again. These, these oh, adults no. have sort of succeeded. The kids are now turned against her. Jerks. And they, uh, this, the wishing star tells PJ, if you don't have these kids' love, you're going to die. And <laughs> she doesn't have their love, so she dies. She fades, her colors fade, and she just apparently drops dead right there. And then oh, <laughs> this kid gosh. that she brought back from her side quest is like, don't die, PJ. And he lays on top of her and cries, which then brings her back to life because someone do, turns out someone does if, love if, her. If Aww. you love someone, lay on top of them and cry. That's the moral. 
Yeah. So <laughs> sounds like the hug a bunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where does all yeah. this mythology yeah. get told? Was it a cartoon or a comic book or the back of the box? Where does this all come from? The, on the VHS tape? Yeah, the VHS, the VHS tape. tape okay. that apparently right. came with the dolls, yeah. Oh, and you can man. watch this on YouTube. Right. It's it's out there. No uh, but thanks. I got to tell you, well, like <laughs> I'm telling you right now, and, and, and I had this feeling when, I'm not kidding, when, when Kat was telling the Hug a Bunch story, talking about the sectors, <laughs> I felt like I was on a trip, like I left Earth. <laughs> I felt it felt so dark and sick, and I felt like I needed a shower. I'm not kidding. I felt oh, really no. messed up after watching this cartoon. I was skipping oh. through it as quickly as I could to try to get out of it. Mm. I just wanted to end. Why not? End. It's probably it like was, one of your dreams, it right? It was really trippy. <laughs> I mean, it could have been like a horror movie where someone finds a VHS tape and then like the ring or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see Aww. a bunch of images that then you get a phone call. That's what I wow. felt like was going to happen. Like that kind of nervousness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Goodness. What do you got, John? Well, so, <laughs> so would you like to talk about one of the most popular toy lines from the early oh. 80s. Oh, yeah. Transforming robots called the Transformers. Yes, I would. I love the Transformers. <laughs> we're, well, we're not going to do that, though. Oh. We're going to talk about the freaking mm, GoBots. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, well, so Hasbro brought the Transformers from Japan, and they were making a, a killing on them. Kids love them. They're great. They're well-designed. They're super popular. Um, mm -hmm. And so Tonka was like, we can do that. We make trucks and crap. So we can, so they decided to also make their line called the GoBots. Yep. And I think everybody knows what, you don't have to explain the toys. They're transforming robots that turn into things, a, you know, a car or a mm -hmm. boat or whatever. And then it's a robot that mm -hmm. has a gun or whatever. So, uh, so it had a, it had a cartoon also. This one ran for like two years, oh. 65 episodes, wow. 84 to 85. Wow. wow. And the toy line was like 83 to 87. So it, it lasted a while, but it never had the popularity of Transformers. But sure. I don't know why with this crazy backstory that is mm -hmm. <laughs> outlined in the story. So here, here's the idea. Yep. GoBots are from Gobatron. Of course, I remember that be. much. Do you? Okay. Uh. So this it was a race. Initially, they were a race of humanoids. They were people, basically, called the Gobings. Okay. Was it also a utopia? Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't. Oh, it was okay. just kind of average. Yeah. So thousands of years ago, a terrorist group known as the Renegades start a war with a group of peaceful people called the Guardians. That's a lot of names in this story. And that ruined mm -hmm. the planet. Okay. So war destroyed all this, right? So it's horrible. Mm. They're facing extinction. And it's, it's really uh -huh. simple from here. Yeah. So look, we're not going to survive on this planet. We've decimated the planet. It's it's just torn up and from war and nuclear, who knows what, right? And these are human so characters, they right? These are not- Basically not, humanoid. They're, human, yeah, they're people. Now. Oh, okay. They're people. No, no, no. No, no, no. So they yeah. seek out- a, a man known as the last engineer, not because he was a genius scientist who could save the planet or, right. or cure the world or anything like that. No, it's because this guy has been systematically on purpose yep. cutting off parts of his body and replacing it with <sighs> robot pieces his entire life. Oh my God. Just because <laughs> he just does it. This yeah. is a body horror movie. Yeah. So the go Bings <laughs> find the last engineer uh huh. Yep. They have the last engineer transplant their brains oh, into God. robot bodies, oh, no. allowing them to survive oh. as GoBots. But wait, wait. Yep. He provided <sighs> these with no discrimination between the Guardians and the Renegades. Well, that's so saying, hey, you can all be robots. Now you guys oh go gosh. fight an eternal war on this decimated planet. Oh my God. And he disappeared. He took off. What a, what a did. This reminds <laughs> me of a couple things. I remember one of my earliest nightmares as a kid. I think okay. I was like six years old. I remember exactly where I lived. I think, you know, memories, you know, no, you know, not okay. reliable yeah. there anymore. Mm. The, the nightmare was that it turns out I was a brain in a jar. What? You know? And when I realized I was a brain in a jar, I woke up like, oh my God. Now cut to, do you remember, or similarly, RoboCop 2, when they're trying to make another mm -hmm. RoboCop, they yes. keep putting humans yes. inside of robots and it goes horribly yep. wrong. Cause there's, I mean, it's, it's a messed up thing. It's horrible and it's uh -huh. painful. And every one of them, I kills himself. Yeah, one, one shoots with the himself brain in the head, out. one yes. pulls his, yes. yeah. oh, that's what that oh. reminds me of. That would be a horrible existence. Yeah. And so now in case you didn't know, think yeah. back, every GoBot you've ever seen has a human brain inside. Oh no. Have fun kids. Yeah. <laughs> also, look, look, really, really nerd out here. In Revenge of the Jedi, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there's this when uh, I think it's either when Luke, I think when it's Luke comes into uh, Jabba's palace. I think it was. Did he Luke. nerd out and call it Revenge of the Jedi? Sorry. He totally yeah. did. It's Return. Now Revenge. we know initially it was going to be called Revenge of the Jedi, but later it was called Return of the Jedi. Thank I don't you, think John. it was a deep cut. I think it was a screw up. But go ahead. <laughs> 
Anyway, so back to Blue Harvest, like I was saying. Oh, so in Blue oh Harvest, my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry. Deeper cut. You're right. I meant R- Return of the Jedi. Star Wars Return of the oh. Jedi. It's either when Luke comes in or the or the uh, the droids. In the background, you see like yes. this spider-like creature walk by in the distance and have like oh. a glass bowl. You don't remember this? It's like long legs. It was a practical Mm-mm. effect. It turns it, out yeah. that those were the former monks of this temple that Jabba took over. Oh, and no. what oh they gosh. do is they, these monks, by choice, evolve to a higher sort of level that they have their mm-hmm. brains removed and put in these jars so they live as these robots then. That always or is a kid terrifying. GoBots, if you will. Yeah, GoBot. Yeah, that's the same <laughs> Basically, yeah. The first Self, GoBot. <laughs> self-induced GoBotery taking place I there would choose death. Wouldn't you guys choose death in an apocalyptic world? Ah, uh, yeah, mm. I'd be okay oh, with oh, that. Oh, oh. I think. Yeah, I, going all <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh-oh. How big is the jar? <laughs> <laughs> How much space do I have? Right. right. Yeah. Can I have visitors? <laughs> All right, Kat, do you, do you have one for us? Let's round it out. Do you have one more? I do have okay. one for you. I Here confess I watched this one too. Watched it recently or as a kid, you mean? Yeah, like right oh, before oh, okay. we were meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean like today. Yeah. Okay. I watched it. Right. <laughs> okay, so, well, for the most part, the Rainbow Bright oh, uh, okay. cartoon series, that's what we're going to talk yeah, about here, okay. was um, reportedly pretty innocuous. Oh. But then- they released a two-part special uh, called The Beginning of Rainbow Land. And children were thus exposed to Rainbow Bright's terrifying origin <laughs> story. <laughs> so they didn't even have to do it. The product was out there. It was probably popular. It was done. Yep. Then they observed the it's landscape. Already popular. All right. We've lured them in. Now we, now now, we tell them what's yeah, really going we've on. We've got them right where we want them. <laughs> Time to mess up some childhoods. So Rainbow Bright was not always Rainbow Bright. She oh, was originally yeah. Wisp. I remember was that. Her name. From somewhere. Oh, you remember that? Yeah. I never knew that. Okay. Mm. Well, Wisp was a human toddler who was zapped onto a freaky gray mystery planet. Oh, Sound mm. familiar? Like it's a little like PJ Sparkles. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, by some non corporeal voices. <laughs> Don't say a word, John. Do not say a word. <laughs> yeah. And it was her job to redeem the planet, to give it color. <laughs> That's it her job. Incorporeal. Incorporeal. Like, Speaking of child labor laws. Yeah, whatever. Well, I said non-corporeal, incorporeal. Is that a better whatever, way to whatever, say Whatever, whatever. I'm not John yeah. here. I'm, I'm not the grammar police. All right, good, good. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think it's anti-corporeal. This- <laughs> I'm against it. I'm against it. <laughs> Shape and form. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, she's told by the voice that she has to find the Spear of Light, which is held captive in a castle by a being known as the Evil One. Okay. And, and the Evil One, for most of the show, is a booming hole in the ceiling, like a loud talking hole okay. in the ceiling of the castle. Of okay. <laughs> and he wants, he wants to keep the land in darkness. Okay. okay it's so, supposed to be like the absence of light, I guess. Like I a black guess. hole. Literally a black I, hole. That works. Mm. All right. Okay. But I just I just need to pause here and say, okay, so <laughs> right here, to me, Wisp is absolutely living like a 1980s kid here. Like okay. and even like a Stranger Things kid. And she might as well even be in the upside down. Upside if you watch down, this yeah. show. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> if yeah. you watch this. Oh, oh my god. Right yeah. Ash Gray. Ah. Uh-huh. The On Duffer the Brothers planet. stole Rainbow Bright. <laughs> It could be Twinkletown too, almost. It could be, it could be. Oh, it's crazy. So there's no responsible adults to be seen anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's random lightning strikes. Like in North America. (laughs) Exactly. There's bulging rivers of lava. There's all sorts of evil creatures who are constantly trying to capture or kill Wisp. Um, There's like menacing vultures. There's multi-tusked, more multi-tusked creatures. All right, now talking. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. Oh. I like, I like, I like yeah. your booming hole. Let me tell you. Oh. oh no! Oh no! No no! Okay, back on <laughs> makes, track. Back makes on my track. tusks tingle. That's number four on the list. <laughs> At one point, Wisp declares, "I guess I'm on my own." <laughs> You've anyway. been on your own your whole the whole time. <laughs> I mean, <right? laughs> well, no, because then she bumps into her eventual sidekick he becomes her sidekick named twink uh and <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna see if john would let that go by nope, no he didn't not a chance <laughs> zero possibility i wasn't gonna crack a smile so wisp and twink are yes 
so much to Google. Conversing. So much. Hurts. So Hurts. they soon encounter a field full of statues, which turn out to be frozen corpses. Oh. Of other beings mm. that have tried to reach the castle where she's trying to get to get the sphere of light. Oh they find God. a frozen. I know. Yeah. There's a frozen horse um, whom they help to crack out of the ice. And it's a talking horse. Mm-hmm. Like okay. you, you also oh, mentioned naturally. the talking like horse. Blaze. And this is the most haughty, arrogant, conceited horse. Its name is Starlight. And it, it oh, yeah, just, that's Rainbow Bright's horse. That was Rainbow Starlight. Bright's horse. That's right. Well, this yeah. horse is really rude. Stolen from the upside <laughs> really down. Really conceited. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very mm. haughty. They all go on together to find the rainbow belt. Somehow, I forget how. I even watched the show. I forget how mm. this. <laughs> they have to find a rainbow belt and the sphere of light. But basically, the rest of the show is our heroes that (laughs) I've been talking about (laughs) rescuing the color kids. That's a team of kids who are each in charge of one of the colors of the rainbow. Oh, okay. (laughs) Okay. So the color kids, they all need to be rescued from uh, all sorts of varying and horrible imprisonments. I feel like I need to be rescued. (laughs) 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 Who's going to save us? Somebody (laughs) send me a snarky horse quick. (laughs) <laughs> that won't give us a ride <laughs> okay i'm sorry Kat. so all the while um they need to be rescued okay <laughs> which which action lures wisp and her company to the castle where brave wisp faces off with the evil one that we now get to okay, see finally yeah I thought that we was finally mm. yeah yeah we get to see it he's holding the baby in his fist it's not a hole anymore He's not a hole anymore. No. Oh, okay. He's not a hole. He's so he's, he's a fist, a, not a hole. He's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the visual aid, Will. I wasn't really. Kept, that's what I'm trying. I to wasn't picking yeah, up on turned, what you're putting down. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine. Do you see the hole again, or just now? No more. No more hole. Intermittently, no more. <laughs> yes. Right. There's a robe. He's got a big robe on. There's glowing okay. eyes. Yep. Hardly any face, and. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Conveniently, a wisp uh-huh. is able to suddenly shoot rainbows out of the rainbow belt, and uh-huh. she sends one wrapping and twisting around the evil one yeah. until he's crushed by the rainbow. <laughs> Only she the murders cloak him? is left. <laughs> so more than one kid in this our stories murdered people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huh. Okay. Yes. Correct. And this didn't show up on your list of crazy <laughs> toys that people thought were demonic. Well, it's funny you should mention that because regarding Rainbow Bright, uh-huh. the turmoil of the toy box, Phil Phillips said this, the very basis for the series, the rainbow causes concern. Mm. New agers oh. use rainbows to signify their building of the rainbow bridge between man and Lucifer, Oh, who they say is the oversoul. Mm. Who would have thought the rainbow was the problem? I, didn't, and I did not see that coming. <laughs> An oversoul, booming yeah. hole. See, it's all coming oh. together. They can all work together, these guys. Oh. Yeah. Should I wrap this up here? Yeah. Oh, you have yeah. Any questions? Yep. No, it's just, yeah. Uh, uh, the grace landscape becomes colorful. Wisp is christened rainbow bright by the non corporeal oh, right. voice. She was a and christening. Live, Good. There was a christening. They all live happily ever after, I guess. Domino, Nabisco, vacuum. <laughs> I'd like to add here that the author of the original article that yeah. inspired this discussion here is hoping that Rainbow Bright receives some PTSD counseling. <laughs> and also points out that while this special show might seem like an intentionally edgy, gritty reboot of the character, maybe meant for girls in their early teens, yeah. then you realize that the beginning of Rainbow Land is recommended for kids as young as three years old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Wow. You know, there you go. we could probably talk at some point of the shows that traumatize us as kids. Cause I, there's some cartoons I remember that I have to find. Mm. I just have mm-hmm. images in my head of like, wow, that was a real messed up cartoon. I saw, I got to find mm. that are kind of like these ones they're talking about. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 All right. Hey, don't forget to join us. Thanks guys. That was weird. <laughs> I, again, I feel gross. I feel <laughs> gross. And not because of all the jokes I cut out that, that I, the listeners didn't hear. I need a shower. <laughs> that John made exclusively just John. You can all believe uh, that if you want to, but we know. Uh, that's it. They're not editing it out. Know. The whole they show's need, going in. 
<laughs> they know it wasn't me. So. It definitely wasn't Kat. It was, all right, it was me and John. All right, me, uh, me and John. All right, whatever. Uh, but please join us Thursday. Wait, what was I saying? Thanks, guys. We need a shower. Okay, yeah, but I wanted to remind everybody to please join us on Thursday, uh, this Thursday, August 11th at 7.30 p.m. That's a weird time, but it's like a wedding where you start at the upstroke. 7.30 p.m. Eastern. That's right. That's right. We're going to be meeting on Facebook Live. We're going to be doing a live podcast, the one that's going to be airing the following Monday. We want your participation. We want to hear your comments. We want your feedback because the topic is terrible movies with great music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows one or two, and we're going to be discussing those with your feedback that night. Okay. Other than that, let's say thank you to our early oh, no, adopters. Wait, wait. Yeah, what? I want to do this. Hey, we want to thank our supporters over at Patreon, <laughs> including yeah. our early adopters like Karen Flieger and Kathy Burke and Rick Parker. Oh yeah. And also our secret of my success level Patreon supporters. Oh, John Henderson. Mm-hmm. Craig Coletta, John Kaminsky, and our very own John Reddick. Yay! We're looking for some more supporters, okay? We're opening it up. We had it shut down so as to have no more supporters. Mm-hmm. But we've right. got room for a couple more. <laughs> Just- if you go to patreon.com slash 1980s now, quickly... Get, you got to do this quickly. Limited availability. You can get... You can just... <laughs> Supplies are limited. Chuck it a buck and become one of our supporters. Seriously, for a pittance... Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. A month. We're talking about a month too, right? You know, a dollar a month. That's, That's like it. 25 cents an episode. That's a ridiculous bargain. <laughs> right? All right. Hey, uh, we will talk to you next time on 1980s Now. Next time. <laughs> Bye-bye now. <laughs>